Hi, uh, I'm, I'm so excited to be here and tell you guys about what we've been doing at the University of Chicago and what we, uh, the programming that we have instituted uh, along the lines of trying to help people become, students become more resilient. But before I do that though, um, I just wanted to get an idea of who I'm talking to. Maybe raise your hand if you're from I'm somewhere an undergraduate, affairs working undergraduates. There are some, and then um, and people in um, the health services, health center. There. Maybe, okay. And then, um, any other areas represented here today? Graduate education. Graduate education, fantastic. Well, we're just like, student services. Student services. Office of Accessible Education. Fantastic. So, pretty uh, a broad smattering of folks all involved uh, working with students. Well, so, uh, I want to tell you guys about. Uh, Something we have started at the University of Chicago called, we're calling the Resilience Project, and I know you have a Resilience Project here as well. Ours is a little different. Uh, yours, I've been on your website and seen uh, some of the work you've been doing. It's very interesting and exciting. Uh, but I got interested in this idea, this question of resilience, and, and the reason I, I did uh, was because when I started in primary care years and years ago, uh, it became very clear to me early on that there's a big difference between uh, the resilience of one patient to another patient. I remember really vividly one day actually uh, talking to a patient in one room who had a runny nose and was absolutely devastated by the runny nose and how it was interfering with their, their, their life, his life. Uh, and I was, remember doing my best to be sympathetic to that. But then the next patient whom I actually was talking to, someone who had just been diagnosed with terminal cancer, and seemed completely at peace with that diagnosis. And I remember thinking, not that this was a new thought, that some people seem to be stronger than others, but what a contrast that was. And I wondered, I got wondering at that moment, whether or not resilience was something that we're just lucky enough to be born with, or unlucky enough to be born without, it was actually something we ourselves could do, uh, could take action to increase. That was where my interest really began. And uh, I'm also a Buddhist, a practicing Buddhist, and in fact, the fundamental tenet of the type of Buddhism I practice, which is called Nichiru Buddhism, is that happiness ultimately depends, happiness being the ultimate goal in life, uh, ultimately depends on our being strong. And the practice of the type of Buddhism I practice is geared towards helping us to become strong, become more resilient. And so I got very interested to know, uh, one, the, you know, my Buddhist practice and how it has helped me to become stronger, what was the science? Was there science behind any of these ideas that have been passed down for the last 2,500 years uh, in, in Buddhism? And it turned out that there was a lot. And I found myself having these same conversations with patients and people over and over and over because most of my patients, whatever their reality may be, there's, there's often, I should say, a component of anxiety that accompanied that or a sense that. What was the, the disease they were facing, the symptom they were facing, what did it mean for their lives, and what were they going to do with that? And so I found myself having a lot of conversations about how to manage the emotional impact of disease, and, and how, how could I help people become more resilient in some way. And then when I moved into student health, uh, and discovered really that nowhere and no population, I think, is the issue of inner strength and resilience more imperative than in a student population, both undergraduate and graduate. And I remember when I first took the job talking to one of the people at Student Affairs who told me that the feedback that they had been getting in the recent years from uh, prospective employers of our students at the University of Chicago had been noticing that there seemed to be a lack of emotional resilience among our graduates. And it was a real problem that the college and, the, and even the graduate schools were in some sense trying to address. So in that context, I decided to write a book. And this is the, the cover of my book, and the title is The Undefeated Mind, and it is on the science of constructing an indestructible self. And I've organized this book uh, in, according to principles of Buddhist thinking, but it turns out there's a lot of science that has, in just even the last 10 years, uh, appeared that supports a lot of these ideas. And it ultimately, what it did was suggest a series of workshops that we decided to call from the book that I've done, the research I've done for the book, uh, and create this project at the University of Chicago called the Resilience Project, which I want to tell you about. But before I do that, I want to talk a little bit about what I, I consider resilience to be. Because there's many different definitions and different people have different thoughts about what this is. And in my mind, resilience is a, is a coin that has two sides. The first is not just to survive, but to thrive in the face of adversity. When that mess lands on you, how well do you maintain your 
your drive, your optimism, your mood, your ability to function, to not just get through that uh, adverse event, but actually thrive as a result of it. The flip side of that coin is something that in the literature is referred to as grit. What, what motivation, what passion do you have to continue on towards a goal when obstacles arise as they invariably do when you're trying to accomplish something uh, important or valuable? And so, in my mind, what, what I really want to do at the University of Chicago, my goal with this project, is not just to inculcate students in the life of the mind, which is what the University of Chicago is all about, but prepare our students to go out into the world with resilience, with the ability to not just survive but thrive when adversity strikes, and to persevere on towards goal achievement when obstacles arise. And it turns out that um, this is a teachable skill. And I'm going to hope to convince you of that by the end of this talk. So one of the things we want to do is prove it. So I, I did all this research and I wrote this book and we talk a lot about very specific suggestions and, and ideas that people can apply in their own lives, but how do we actually know that it's, it is making people more resilient? Well, so there are two scales we decided to use in our project uh, to measure sort of a before and after effect. And this one is the first half of what's called the Conor Davidson Resilience Scale. You can see some of the questions that it asks. Um, and it's a self-reported scale. And here's the second half of it. And um, the, you get a score, and the higher the score, it predicts your, your greater sense of resilience. And it correlates to things like people in, uh, with mental uh, health issues who are being counseled, uh, folks who end up uh, transitioning, or I should say improving in the course of therapy, end up having higher Connors and Connor Davidson uh, scores. The second um, score is called the GRIT scale. And this again gets to the other side of the studies, the idea that uh, the, the passion that perseveres, the ability to push on through obstacles and achieve your goals is, uh, is measured by this scale. Uh, and it turns out, interestingly, grit, as measured by the scale, does not correlate with intelligence at all. Undoubtedly, explaining why so many very intelligent people are not necessarily among the most successful people. But there's, it's a separate, um, a separate issue. Uh, but it, it, it turns out that people who uh, have high grit scores based on this scale, uh, that, that those high scores are associated with higher GPAs. That was actually a study conducted in a Ivy League schools, Ivy Plus schools. It leads to a greater retention of students in college. Uh, specifically, one of the studies was in the United States Military Academy. Uh, and it also, interestingly, correlates with better performance in national spelling bees. So that's just some of the, the studies that have been done to suggest that actually, if you actually score high, on self critic grit, it actually predicts a certain degree of success. So these are the, the tools we were using uh, in our pilot project. And I want to tell you a little bit about our pilot project. Uh, we, our thought was we want to test, we designed the interventions, which I'm going to tell you about. We want to test these interventions against the, these, script, these scores. Uh, but our, our first idea was to do a pilot with a very small number of students, not necessarily to be looking for an effect, even though we were hoping to find it. But just to learn how to do this, to learn was this even feasible? Were students interested in it? Did they want to come? And did they themselves find this guide? So we brought, we actually advertised um, at the beginning of the, this school year, and we, we got 16 students to come and sign up. And the first thing we did the very first day, and this is the beginning of our fall quarter, we were in a quarter system, so there's three quarters, each 11 weeks. And the first thing we did was we administered two instruments, the PHQ-9 and the GAD-7. The PHQ-9 measures, it's an instrument to look at um, depression scores, and the GAD is for um, generalized anxiety. And what we found, again, this is uh, to the pretest, was that the mean of the PHQ-9 is 7. Uh, the standard deviation you see there, a range of 2 to 14. And interestingly, the number of people uh, who uh, passed the endpoint for a diagnosis was 3, which mean, meaning that uh, about uh, 20 to 25 percent of our sample size actually had PHQ-9 scores suggesting a mild to moderate depression, just the baseline. And with the GAD scores, 8, uh, which is about 50% of our students had mild to moderate anxiety, generalized anxiety, which sort of fit with our gestalt about students, our students. Um, we, we actually counseled some of these students at the beginning and suggested that, to that some of them that maybe they visit our counseling center, in addition to joining our resilience project. Um, and then what we did is we actually got the baseline counter Davidson resilience scores and counter Davidson and, um, and the grid scores. And what you can see is that the mean of the resilience score, around 61, was somewhere right in the middle of the range. Um, and it's not particularly high or low. 
either on their university score or their grid scale. That's, that's about their baseline. That's where we start. Okay. So this is what we did. Um, we did three sessions per quarter, and there are three quarters, so nine total sessions. And we're actually in the middle of this right now. We have two to go. Um, the first three in the first quarter focused on one thing only, and that was defining a mission statement, which we'll talk about in a minute. And then following that, six what we call cognitive interventions, or ways that students can become aware of their own thought processes and alter those thought processes in such a way to enhance their resilience and their, and their grade. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to tell you a little bit about some of the science behind uh, the ideas of our, our interventions, and then go into actually our interventions and how we did it, and then at the end, share with you some of the very, very important data we have. So here's this idea about purpose and the value and power of purpose in human beings' lives. We really are meaning-seeking creatures. We are wired that way. And if you look at the scientific literature on the effect of a strong sense of purpose, it turns out actually we have a lot to do with resilience. The first thing is studies show that actually a strong sense of purpose will decrease boredom even more than a good mood. And boredom is a surprisingly common source of suffering among almost I think anybody, but particularly in college students. A strong sense of purpose has been shown to be able to sustain people through adversity and uh, lend our uh, everyday lives a sense of importance. It also, it turns out, increases our ability to tolerate emotional stress. The, the study I listed up there was a qualitative study, a very small study, but it was a palliative uh, care, uh, health care workers, um, nurses, who were working in um, uh, hospice. And it was a qualitative study, and it sort of got a sense of sort of what their uh, level of stress was. And, and ironically, what the literature shows is that though it widely perceived to be the most stressful of all healthcare providing uh, contexts, providing care for the terminally ill, the people who provide care for the terminally ill actually uh, report the least amount of stress, the least amount of burden. And so this study was an attempt to sort of get at why is that? And the self-identified reason in this very small study among the nurses was basically the heightened sense of purpose that they felt for providing care in terminal ill. Okay. It turns out a sense of purpose can also increase our ability to tolerate even physical pain. And this was a study back, done way back in 1966. Uh, and the reason it has been replicated is because this is one of those studies where we were still able to shock medical students without getting um, passing the IRB reports. And so what, what this guy did is he took 80 male undergraduate students and had their, their, their basic shock threshold, shock threshold measured. What, what they, when they did that, they said, okay, what voltage of shock did they report in pain? They figured out what that was. And then they actually tasked these undergraduates learning a list of nine words and repeat them back uh, in, in order without error, and they would receive two painful shocks per trial until they were actually able to repeat the words back in error without error. This is sort of the pretext for the experiment. Then what they did is they took half of them and they said to half, you guys, have, we're going to do a second uh, phase of this experiment. You have no choice. You know, we're going to do this um, uh, without, you know, this is part of the experiment. You need to do it. But the second group was actually given a choice. They were told you don't have to continue to, to, to participate in the experiment. But they were offered a, re a good reason to do so. Namely that they thought that the results of the study were actually contribute significantly to science and to society or learn something really important they really uh, push that home. And then what they did is they measured their what's called the galvanic skin response, which is actually a way of actually uh, measuring the, the amount of pain that someone is experiencing. Other than what they may tell you, this is the autonomic nervous system doesn't lie. The higher the galvanic skin response, the greater the amount of pain that they're experiencing. And so this is what they found. In the second uh, round of experiments, Though the galvanic skin response did increase in both, consistent with continuing to shock people, it, ex it increased half as much in the experiment. And they reported experiencing less pain, on average, than the, the control group, simply because they felt that they were enduring the shocks for an important reason. 